Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak. Baseball season is fast approaching, so I reached out to an organist from a major league ballpark. His name is Matthew Kamensky, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to him in just a moment. You know that there would be no podcasts without freedom, and there would be no freedom without America's two and a half centuries of heroes, like George Washington. George Washington was the standard bearer for all future presidents, everything from the way that he treated the office of the presidency to the number of terms that the man served. And when American Pride Roasters Coffee set out to make a blend named after him, they wanted to make sure that it was setting the precedent for future coffees. At APRCoffee.com, they are using a Tanzanian bean from a single origin to keep it unique. Their qualifications for the Washington blend have never changed. They say that it's fit to drink with a Wyoming rancher, a Wall Street executive, or anyone in between. I absolutely love the Washington blend. So get over to APRCoffee.com today, order the George Washington blend, give it a try, and when you're over there, be sure to use offer code ATM at checkout, stands for at the mic, A-T-M, when you go to APRCoffee.com, that's going to get you 10% off your order at APRCoffee.com. You're listening to At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Matthew Kaminsky is a talented guy with a very cool job. He plays the organ in a Major League Baseball stadium. Matthew is very creative in how he does his job, and he and I discussed that, along with how different it is to play an organ inside an empty stadium during the COVID era. We talked about his background in music and what a musician listens to. He's got an amazing collection. We have a picture of of his music room posted on the Twitter account uh, for at the Mike show. If you want to check that out, Uh, we talk about how he even ended up with one of the most unique jobs in the world. It's Matthew Kaminsky, the organist for the Atlanta Braves baseball team. He's this week's guest on at the Mike. Matthew Kaminsky, who I am such a huge fan of. Uh, I tell you, I'm, this is this is a fanboy conversation that I'm going to try to uh, be professional about, but he is the organist for the Atlanta Braves, my favorite baseball team. He's there at Truist Park in Atlanta, and he is so creative. Matthew, I tell you, what you do as the organist there at the Braves Stadium is so unique. Uh, just congratulations for, for being the creative force that you are, man. Oh, thank you so much, and thanks for all the compliments. You know, it's um, it's actually something that a lot of baseball organists before me have done, but I seem to have gotten the most, I guess, press out of it or the most right. fan <laughs> feedback from it. <laughs> yeah, you're so creative, man. Um, you take the old school organ, but you put a spin on it. And I know you said that, that, you know, there are other organists that have done this, but I think you've taken, it's a new art because you've also infused social media in what you do. You're on Twitter at Braves Organist. And I have, my, myself, I've personally irritated you uh, in the course of a Braves <laughs> game when, when I don't get the joke. If I'm like, hey, I don't understand that because when it clicks, when you understand the inside joke that Matthew has created, Created for your entertainment, you literally laugh out loud. And when you don't, you you ask him on Twitter, and he usually replies with the uh, explanation. But I mean, just I, I don't I don't want to be so long winded here with this introduction. But I want people to understand because a lot of this audience maybe they don't watch Braves games, they don't understand what I'm referring to. But like for example, Kyle Farmer will come up to bat, and you'll play Old McDonald or a Farmer yeah, in the I, Dell. Farmer in the Dell, yeah, I love it. Sometimes you have multiples, you know, um, and you've been the organist for the Braves for 12 years. Have you been this creative as far as individual tunes for the players from the beginning? Yeah, actually, that was a part of the job description. So, um, oh, the, wow. the first season when I when I joined in 2009, um, my boss wanted me to kind of have that game within the game. So um, <laughs> what Keith is talking about here is I play the walk-up songs uh, for the opposing team. Um, the Braves actually pick their own walk-up song, so we don't have to worry about them. But um, what I do is I kind of create these little musical puns or little jokes, usually based on their name. And then sometimes it's based on 
maybe where they're from or a certain situation that that player has been through. So, um, so yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's the most creative part of my job, you know. Actually, playing the songs is is the easy part, but coming up with right. the songs or figuring out which songs to choose from all the Twitter requests are are usually the hardest part. See, I was reading an article that referenced um, Matt Kemp, who played briefly for the Braves, uh, ended up going uh, to the Dodgers, and um, you had come up with, because he had lost a lot of weight, and so you played Stone Temple Pilots, Half the Man I Used to Be, which is a riot. (laughs) And then you played a Rihanna song, because I guess he used to date her. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. just so much creativity. Do you... And I don't want to say sit around, but do you, is a, is a large part of your job basically, well, I don't know, sitting around coming up with these um, um, tunes to play? Is that part of the gig there? Well, not these days. So um, at, at mm. first, you know, maybe my first season or two, um, I was coming up with pretty much all of them myself. But then um, when Twitter really kicked in around my second or third season is when uh, mm. people really got kind of... Um, you know, uh, clued into to what I was doing. My my Twitter feed. Uh, now these days, I think I have about nineteen thousand followers, and mm-hmm. it seems like every single fan wants their their song choice heard. <laughs> so, uh, so these days, instead of me thinking about all the songs, what I'll do is I'll I'll go to Twitter and I'll go to my. Um, I have a Braves Organist Facebook page as well. And I'll just kind of um, ask people, you know, what would you choose for these players? I kind of give them my first impression of what I would play. But then, um, you know, for, for each game, I, I would play usually two or three songs per batter. So um, it gives a lot of the fans a couple different chances, I guess, of getting their songs being played. So so these days, um, you know, the decision is mine, but a lot of the, the – um, song choices really comes from Braves fans or even um, the opposing team's fans. Yeah, that's that's really good that if you're, if you're a fan of a team that's going to be traveling to Atlanta, then definitely tweet at Braves Organist and give him some ideas. Well, you just talked about, you mentioned publicity. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to assume that the most publicity you got was this past summer in the 2020 season when the Toronto Blue Jays came to town. Is that correct? <laughs> um, I'm not too sure who you're refer- referring to here. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, Reese Actually, McGuire. I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Reese McGuire, and I'll, and I'll state this for the audience, uh, he was, um, shall we say, uh, had a brush with law enforcement in a parking lot, and he was... Um, he was in an uh, interesting position. And so that made the news. And um, if you make the news in an embarrassing way and Matthew finds out about it, then it's going to end up part of your walk-up song. And so, <laughs> so Matthew, uh, and I remember hearing this at the time when you played Michael Jackson's Beat It, and I didn't know the story. And and that was one of those moments where I'm sitting there like, wait, I don't understand. Why is he Michael Jackson? And I just kind of let it go. You know, it's like I wasn't near a computer or something, and, you know, I wasn't going to have the opportunity to Google. So it just it just went by. And then it started making the news, and I saw it on Twitter, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> so Well, that was uh, actually, um, that was one of those instances where I didn't know the story either. Until uh, fans had tweeted me before the the Blue Jays came up to Atlanta to play the Braves, so mm-hmm. um, that's where the fans really help because I'm not really on you know I'm not on ESPN all the time searching for uh, different stories behind these guys' careers. You know I I'm usually uh-huh. given kind of um, the heads up, and it's usually <laughs> actually it's usually from their fan base. So I think if I remember correctly, I think it was a Toronto fan that kind of clued me in on it. Wow. Um, so uh, so I, I take now, uh, suggestions from both sides, I guess. So did the fan come up with the song or just make you aware of the news story? Well, whenever there's any sort of news story that happens in baseball, usually fans will tweet me the story. Even in the off season, I usually you know, get some tweets saying, you know, um, like, you know what to do when they came up to town next time, Braves organist. <laughs> it was on my radar. I got gotcha. you. Okay, so you've been with the Braves for 12 seasons. Were you born and raised in Braves country as a Braves fan, as even a baseball fan? Where was your childhood? 
Well, I actually grew up in Chicago, so I uh-huh. uh, grew up a uh, on the north side. So I, I was a Cubs fan growing up, mm-hmm. and um, you know the Braves. Even though they were on TBS, they were not really on my radar. The, the Cubs would play the uh, the Cardinals a lot, and then they would play the right. Mets a lot back then. And so I don't really even recall hearing too much about the Braves, other than maybe passing it by on on TBS every once in a while. So it was it wasn't until um, 1998 is when I uh, moved to the Atlanta area and you know started hearing more about the Braves and then when I got the job in 2009 that's when I really uh, started following the team. So you said that you were specifically hired for this kind of creative energy and dare I say genius. I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, <laughs> who was responsible for that hire um, that said, "Hey, we want you to do this"? And and how did you how did you come to know that there was an opening because i don't know that that you open up the atlanta journal and constitution one ads and there is you know we need an organist for atlanta braves baseball games how did that come to be for you well really it fell in my lap so one of my Hmm. adults because i've been teaching um organ piano and accordion lessons since about 2000 and one of my adult students just happened to know the audio engineer at the braves games so Uh. in 2000 um i think it was 2008 he he mentioned that they were looking for an organist and if I would be interested. And that was the first time I ever even had thought about it or even had heard that the Braves were looking for an organist. And um, during that lesson, he actually texted his friend who actually called my boss. And my boss, um, his name is Scott Cunningham. He, he gave me a call like an hour later. So within like within about two hours of even finding out that there was a job available, um, I actually got a call and um, an interview probably two weeks later, I think it was. Okay. So everything happened really fast. Um, I ended up making a little CD for my interview just to show them what I could play. And, um, and that's where uh, Scott Cunningham actually told me his idea of playing walk-up songs and kind of having that game within the game. So it was something from the start that he wanted to introduce to fans so that they kind of have another tier of entertainment at the games. It is absolutely the game within the game. And even if the score um, down on the field is 12 to nothing after two innings, you know, you still have the, uh, although, however, let me ask you this. I think I've noticed, and I might be incorrect here, Maybe if the Braves are getting blown out and it's really embarrassing, I'm thinking specifically a particular playoff game against the Cardinals a couple of years ago. Uh, do you stop? Do you just like, all right, I, I got to stop doing the, the walk-up songs? Or do you keep going? It's usually told to me to not play much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, contrary to popular belief, I don't really have that much pool around there. So. I'm pretty much told <laughs> when to play and what to do. So when yeah, they ask me to stop playing, then I stop playing. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I know I, in particular, you, you just reminded me, I remember tweeting you at one point because whenever the sound effects guy, whoever that is at the Brave Stadium, would hit the doorbell thing, my dogs would start barking. they run to the front <laughs> door. And I realize it's just poor dog ownership at that point and, and poor training. But I remember I remember tweeting you. I was like, hey, man, if that's you on the doorbell, can we stop that? And you were very <laughs> kind. And you said, I'm not in charge of the sound effects, man. So anyhow. Um, yeah, thankfully. So, actually, I'm, I'm very um, happy about that. I'm, I'm happy that all I have to do is play the organ at the Braves games. There are actually other organists um, – Dieter Ruhl comes into mind. Dieter is the organist for the Dodgers. Uh-huh. And he also handles sound effects. And I think he also plays kind of the pre-recorded songs as well. Oh so my. there are other organists who do all three jobs of like sound effects, songs, and then play on the organ. And oh. I'm, I'm happily just playing the organ. And there are some, um, some of the organists, they prefer to play with a drum machine or some sort of backing track. But I just like playing, you know, I like the kind of pure organ, old timey uh-huh. sound. You know, I don't I don't want to add any drum machines or grooves or anything like that because I want it to be kind of that old school feeling. And that's exactly, so. yeah, what I wanted to ask you, what your booth looks like. Really, it's, I'm, I'm in the audio booth. So it's, uh, there's kind of two rooms in there, but there's one room for all the video guys and then one room for all the audio guys. So in front of me is... Uh, Casey Motter, who's the PA announcer for the Braves. 
Okay. And then um, next to him in front of me, because I'm in the kind of the second row of that, that room, is uh-huh. the DJ. And then next to her is the, um, the guy who handles all the volumes, um, so the big mixing board. So in our audio booth, there's only four of us there. And, um, you know, luckily this year, um, we, we got to play um, even for the shortened season. And there was plexiglass all around us. So they, they mm-hmm. made sure that we, we felt safe and, you know, we all had to kind of um, do our part in wearing masks and such like that. But Casey Motter needs to um, announce players without the mask on. So, so they made it, nice. um, they made it re- really safe for us. And, um, you know, it was, it was not an ideal situation, but we made it work this year. Right. And, and as you're talking about the sound booth and all the different uh, moving parts, um, the thought comes to mind from the 2020 season, the fake crowd noise, speaking to at least the Atlanta Braves and Truist Park, where was that operation? Was that a separate booth? Other people, any anybody in particular, where was that done? No, that was actually a separate person, and I believe they were either in the audio, or I'm sorry, the video room, mm-hmm. or there was actually a little booth next to the audio booth that um, uh, that my boss sometimes goes in to watch games. So um, it was a separate person um, just handling the crowd noise. Okay. And a lot of people were kind of confused about that because they thought that they were just hearing it at home, but it was actually piped into the stadium. So you could actually wow. hear it outside or um, as players were playing, I guess um, the players didn't mind it because it kind of drowned it out a lot of their talking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so their I colorful say, language got kind of covered, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Not all the time, Don Mattingly, but I will say that <laughs> I, I will say that that our fake crowd noise operator in Atlanta was far and away the best. And yes, I'm biased, but when the Braves would travel and there would be I forget where it was. I want to say Florida. But there was just uh, this long delay from when the event happened on the field until the crowd reacted. And you thought, man, I got spoiled by the fake crowd noise operator in Atlanta. But that's that's great. So you do give lessons, right? Private lessons to people that want to learn the piano or the organ. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, you know, for the past about 20 years, I've been uh, teaching full time. And um, this year I've kind of switched everything over to virtual. Um, so I'm not teaching in person anywhere, but um, um, I do teach, you know, throughout Monday through Fridays on Zoom and FaceTime. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a different way of teaching through uh, online means, but it's working. I don't know if it'll replace being in person because there's things that I could show people in person that I can't do online. But, um, and- you know, this this year we're making it work, so... I'm glad yeah, that my I, students have stuck by me. Right. And I was going to say, you know, if you were interested in lessons, the, the way I was going to say this is, hey, if you're in Metro Atlanta and, and you're interested in lessons, reach out to Matthew. His web address is Matthew Kaminsky, K-A-M-I-N-S-K-I. I got that right, correct? Mm-hmm, that's correct. Kaminsky. Yep. Okay, cool. I wasn't even looking at it. I just make sure I spelled that right. And then <laughs> as you're explaining the Zoom situation, it hit me, duh. Really, I guess anybody could reach out to you for a lesson since it's online now. So has it yeah. opened up a, a different different clientele, a, a, a different pool of people now? Yeah, I've got one student who's in uh, near Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had other students. One guy was in San Diego. Um, so, um, as long as we understand our time zones correctly, yeah. <laughs> things could line up pretty well. Um, uh-huh. and, and you, you know, usually, um, between zoom and FaceTime, usually the, the connection is good enough where we could make things work. Okay. Um, so yeah, so far it's, it, it's working well, you know, it, it's been definitely a learning curve, but, but we're making it work. So you grew up. In Chicago, over 20 years ago, you ended up in Metro Atlanta and ended up working with the Atlanta Braves as the ballpark organist. When you were a kid growing up, did you ever have in the back of your mind, because I knew I wanted to be in radio since I was eight years old. Did you think I want to be a ballpark organist when you were a kid at that age? or, Or what did you want to do when you were growing up? Well, you know what? I don't think, you know, perhaps when I was um, going to Wrigley Field and, you know, I've I've seen maybe, I don't know, eight or 10 Cubs games growing up, um, I would hear the organ and I was, I would kind of 
Yeah, I guess I would imagine myself when I was at the games and um, playing the organ, but it was never really a, a lifelong goal of mine to become a baseball organist. When I was young, you know, my sister and I both took organ lessons and we were pretty much forced to take lessons. There was no choice. <laughs> so wow. growing up, you know, my mom put the oven timer on and she would try to make us practice a half an hour every day. And <laughs> um, it was something that we just did. Like I grew up in a, a big Polish family, so you don't really question your parents when you're young. <laughs> so, yeah, when I was young, you know, I, I knew that I was playing the organ and I, I correlated that with baseball. But it wasn't something that I would ever dream about doing. Mm -hmm. Now, when I got into more of the middle school years and even um, high school, I started really playing for myself. So I would uh, try to learn different songs by um, some of my favorite bands back then were like The Doors and Led Zeppelin and mm -hmm. even uh, Kiss <laughs> and uh, kind of the end of hair metal days. But uh, I would learn songs by ear from a lot of those groups and, and kind of teach myself songs without having to read music. And that actually paid off later on when I started getting into jazz music. So in high school, they were searching for a piano player for the jazz band. And um, since I kind of knew about chords and uh, could play by ear, um, I got to play in the jazz band my sophomore year. And that's where um, my start into jazz music, which continues to this day, kind of just caught on and my love for jazz kind of grew from there. Yeah, and I do want to hit on that uh, at some point because while you are the organist for the Atlanta Braves 81 days out of the year plus uh, the playoffs which we hope garners a world series this year mm -hmm. um you do you record i mean you get into a studio and so where can people find the things that you record outside of Truist Park you can find out most things about me on my website so Okay. www.matthewkaminski.com. But yeah, a lot of people don't realize that, well, before the pandemic, I was playing roughly 115 baseball games a year because on top of the Braves, I also played for UGA baseball. Oh, And also wow. University of Georgia, as well as um, some Auburn games every year. Oh, my. And also um, I, I do a handful of um, Auburn softball and a couple of years ago, I even traveled to Mississippi State and did a weekend of MSU baseball games. So every year, I roughly do about 110, 115 baseball games, including the Braves and, and college. Mm -hmm. And then um, another about 100 gigs on top of that, just being a musician. <laughs> so I play in various jazz groups. And like I said, this is all before the pandemic, but I also play in a salsa band that's pretty active. I play a couple times a week. I played a polka band in October whenever I'm available, <laughs> whenever there's <laughs> yeah. not playoffs games. Uh, <laughs> between the piano, accordion, and organ, I'm pretty busy on all three instruments. My schedule stays pretty much busy throughout the whole year. And then you, you talked about recording as well. So throughout the year, I get various recording projects. And yeah, that's something I also enjoy because I have s some recording equipment here at home that I could actually record organ parts, you know, at home or... So if your band has like needs some Hammond B3 organ on it or needs some acoustic <laughs> accordion, you know, you could send me an MP3 of your song and I could record it here at the studio and <laughs> uh, send it back. So I don't even have to travel to a studio these days. So y you talked about obviously the Braves play there in Atlanta and you talked about going to the University of Georgia, which is due east a couple of hours. But then you talked about going over to Auburn, Alabama, due west a couple of hours. How many miles do you put on your car in a typical year, Matthew? <laughs> well, a typical year is about, I want to say, 22,000 miles. Okay. Uh-huh. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good chunk, right? It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I think you alluded to this, if I picked up correctly, how you can hear a song and then you know how to play it. Is that how you are? In other words, if I make a request in the middle of the afternoon that you think is a good one for the game that night, do you need the music in front of you? Or do you kind of work it out, you know, in the afternoon and that way you're ready to go at night? How does that work, that process there? Well, I do know how to read music, so um, okay. I don't want to make it seem like I don't read music. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I, I, I I've worded done... that poorly. I guess I meant can you just play by ear um, and not necessarily have to have the sheet music in front of you, I guess, is my point. Right. Yeah. So um, going through college music programs, you definitely need a certain uh, reading 
you know, ability. I have that part of me. So I'm, I'm able to get a lot of gigs because of my reading um, skills. Because, for example, the salsa band I play with, sometimes we're given music on the spot and mm-hmm. we have to play it on the bandstand. You know, you, there's no rehearsal. You just have to sight read it. So, um, so I do read music, but a lot of what I do for the, the Braves games would take entirely too long to search for music for. Right. Um, so what I do with all these suggestions or songs that I'm, I'm wanting to learn to play for each game is I'll look at the YouTube clip of usually um, a walk up is about 30 to 40 seconds. So mm-hmm. um, I'm going to look at the most popular part of the song or try to hum the most recognizable part of the song. Okay. And and for me, that doesn't take very long to figure out. So I, if I'm at a game and I get a request, I'll look it up on YouTube on my iPad, and then I have a little kind of organ app on my phone that I could at least get the key of the song in. So if I know what key this song is, now, it's not entirely important that I played it in the original key that it's recorded in, but I find that fans will recognize the song a lot better if it's in that original key. So, for example, if I'm playing Van Halen's Jump and I start off playing that like bum, 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 bum. If I play that in a wrong key, I think kind of subconsciously (laughs) people will know that it's not quite right. So for the games, I try to stick with the original keys. Okay. You know, usually it doesn't take me very long to learn 30 to 40 seconds of a song. How cool. So before each series, you know, I look at the roster and and all the um, kind of suggestions that the fans give me, and then I kind of start figuring out what I might play. Now, what works on the organ sometimes is not what the fans want to hear. So, um, <laughs> so I have to choose songs that will either be recognizable or that will work on a melodic instrument. So. A lot of times rap songs are not going to work as well because there's a spoken word <laughs> element there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and whenever there's a spoken word, you know, whether it be rap or hip hop or whatever it might be, you can't really imitate that spoken word with one note. You know, yeah. it doesn't quite come out. So sometimes with a rap song what I'll do is I'll I'll figure out a different like a baseline or if there's a specific kind of um melodic part in the song like a synthesizer or or even um you know a guitar or something i'll figure out the kind of the main part of the song but sometimes those don't quite work on the traditional organ i see have you ever heard from a player after the fact i I don't i don't know have you ever heard any whether it's a a criticism or even if it's a compliment really uh of, of the songs that you chose for them well back when um Jason Worth, when he was with the Phillies, I would play Jesus is Just All Right. He has a similar appearance to Jesus. <laughs> so uh, he was telling the um, the Phillies press guys that, that he couldn't believe that I was playing that song for him. So I would play that <laughs> or w- w- What Child Is This for him. So that was always cool. And he seemed like he was a good sport about it. And then um, Lucas Duda comes to mind as well. So When Duda played for the Mets, I would play Canton Races. And what made it kind of different or unique at Braves games is the fans would actually start singing along. So what I would do on the organ is I would play the main parts. I would play... And then I would leave a pause. (laughs) Yeah, so I would leave a pause for a fan like yourself to yell Duda. And um, there was a game where I I had the whole stadium actually singing along with me. Um, And after that game, Duda said that, you know, he's kind of heard it his whole life and, you know, (laughs) that he's kind of over it. But uh, I don't think he kind of – he actually became a a brave a couple years afterwards, so I don't think he held a – a grudge or anything. Always look at the faces of the batters just to see if they're reacting. You know what I mean? Like they're smirking or something like that. And one of these days, I'm going to catch them. Somebody's going to be laughing out loud. You know, <laughs> you know I, I do I do catch that, actually, because I, I do have a monitor in front of me because part of my vision or part of, my, um, part of the field that I'm watching is a little bit obscured. So I use the monitor to see, for example, if someone has caught a fly ball in right field. Uh-huh. So on my monitor, I'll, I'll look at their expression when I'm playing the song. And um, <laughs> the best one came actually this past season. And before the season, we had a couple exhibition games against the Marlins. And I played, um, I played That's Amore for Francisco Cervelli. 
And if you know, um, when he played for the Braves, actually when he played for the um, Pirates as well, that Samari was his, his chosen walk-up song. So a lot of times for former Braves players, I'll play their chosen walk-up song just kind of as a, a little homage to them being a Brave. That's cool. Yeah, what Cervelli did, he brought, he took his bat and pointed to the press box. And he huh. uh, kind of he smiled, and it was a little bit of a, a thank you to me. That's really cool. So that was cool, pretty cool. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I do remember this spring training, and I hope it's you – I'm just going to ask because I I honestly have no idea. But right before they shut down spring training, the Astros played at the Braves. And somebody in the press box in charge of sound down in Florida played the sign. I saw the sign um, by Ace Mm -hmm. of Base. No chance that I owe credit to that fun pun to you, correct? No, so I was not at that game. So you're obviously very busy with playing music pretty much all over the southeast do you have time for hobbies do you have any downtime and like if so what do you enjoy doing well all my downtime or or all my free time is spent with my family so i have two girls they're seven and ten years old these days they're doing digital learning they take up a lot of my time these days and then um taking them to either soccer or softball games or practices, you know, is is a lot of the time that I spend. You know, before the pandemic, really, there was no free time. Now, these days, there's <laughs> too much free time. <laughs> but, uh-huh. uh, Careful what you but, ask for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we've made the best out of it. And, uh, you know, when things kick back in, hopefully next year, they'll be prepared to go back into the busy season again. Right. Now, do your daughters have musical abilities like yourself or do they not focus on music at all yeah they actually take piano and voice lessons and they don't take lessons from me i was (laughs) just about to ask you (laughs) how that goes if you try to teach them or is that ship already sailed yeah if you've ever tried to teach your children something Uh uh-huh uh-huh they don't um they don't exactly listen to you like they would a teacher Exactly. Right. So, so I try to, you know, I'll help them out and they'll ask me for help every once in a while. And and then they'll say, wait, my teacher doesn't tell me to do that. So really, I stay I stay out of it. I um, I let their teacher kind of mold them. And then if they want to come to me and ask me, you know, how to play a certain thing or, you know, a lot of times I'm actually their accompanist when they're singing. So. During their lessons, oh. I actually play piano for them as they sing. And, you know, it kind of works out where I'm a part of their lessons, but I'm not teaching them. I just, I stay quiet and I let their teacher take over. <laughs> that sounds like fun, though, playing with them while they're singing. That has to be a blast, huh? It is. You know, it, I, I've seen them really progress, you know, both in their piano playing and their uh, their voice lessons as well. And sometimes we'll even record in my little studio. And, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty fun. You've been immersed in music since you were a child. It's your job. You participate in that with your daughters on a certain level there. What is your favorite musical genre if you're driving to the store and you put on the radio or or a playlist? What is it that Matthew Kaminsky, Braves organist, likes to listen to? I guess I would consider myself first and foremost a jazz organist. Okay. So I listen to... Um, Players like Jimmy Smith or uh, Jimmy McGriff was another guy or Jack McDuff. There's mm. also newer jazz organists, a guy named Joey DeFrancesco and Tony Monaco and Larry Goldings. So they're not well known to the general public, but to jazz fans, they're well known. So I, I listen to a lot of jazz as well as I'm, I'm a huge Beach Boys fanatic uh, uh-huh. <laughs> if you believe that. So um, I, I also have kind of this side of me that loves 60s and 70s kind of classic rock and uh, harmony based groups. So I love the Beatles. I love the Beach Boys. I love the Raspberries are another group that I love. Even Pink Floyd. And, you know, I still have my love for the Doors and Led Zeppelin like like I did when I was in middle school and Kiss. And mm-hmm. um, so, you know, there's, there's a couple different sides of me when, whenever I'm feeling whatever mood I'm feeling in. Like lately, I've been listening to a lot of Van Halen ever since uh, Eddie yeah. Van Halen passed away. So I brought out my uh, Fair Warning Van Halen record and <laughs> <laughs> been there blasting Unchained. As a musician, I get to play so many different genres of music. And I, 
I actually enjoy listening to all those genres. So, you know, one day in my car, I could be listening to Van Halen, but then the next day I could be listening to a polka album. <laughs> and, um, and then a salsa record the next day. Uh-huh. Um, and I have, um, um, I have probably close to 3,000 records, LP records mm. at, at the house here, um, wow. maybe 5,000 CDs. So I have plenty of music here at the house. Yeah, do you have an entire room? set aside with just records and CDs and stuff or are they scattered about how does that work pretty much there's i have like a musical office where where uh-huh. i keep all my records and and actually i could send you a picture of that uh please i actually have them alphabetized according to genre <laughs> I've, I've had a lot of time these days to alphabetize them uh-huh. and uh That's fun. I have three turntables at the house right now. So I've got one in the bedroom, I've got one in my office, and then one in our living room. I, I, I'm not going to just gloss over the fact that you said there's a turntable in your bedroom. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Does the wife like that, uh, being in there? Do you guys ever play stuff on there a lot? Or It's, it's actually one of those old furniture-style um, credenza-type looking things. So Oh, wow. Um, the one that... It's a big piece of furniture that sits on the floor, yeah. and no, usually I'm playing um, I'm playing those records when she leaves for work. Okay, okay. So uh, <laughs> she doesn't exactly like listening to all the music that I like. We do share a love for a lot of different styles of music, um, but not all, I would say. So um, there's there's times where she can tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> is that piece of furniture you talked about is that one of those incredibly heavy pieces of furniture that is every moving man's nightmare you know it wasn't it wasn't really that incredibly heavy okay. but it's it's something that was like from the 60s so imagine uh-huh. like what people played records from in the 60s you know with okay, the speakers gotcha. kind of built in there so it's like a whole it actually looks good it actually matches our furniture so she doesn't mind that one as much <laughs> that's cool she, she's more or less complaining about the, the jazz songs that I listen to that are over five minutes long <laughs> that's usually where the, the complaints start happening <laughs> uh huh if it was at a, a freestyle jazz and they just never know when to stop playing is that what free form? or even even just I even have just regular albums where songs are maybe 10 or 12 minutes long <laughs> yeah and you're it like doesn't i know you're me. winging this yeah you're you're totally winging this you know that the, you didn't write this song jazz man but uh that's my uh that's my take uh on on jazz and how long those songs <laughs> get out of control there okay so you you've you've alluded to bands that you enjoyed listening to growing up um learning how to play at an early age when maybe you didn't want to what is however your earliest memory from your childhood that you can recall? Well, my dad actually plays the accordion. So uh-huh. um, the accordion, you know, I, even though I didn't learn it from my dad, I, I would learn by watching him play. And so I remember him playing the accordion around the house and we would have <laughs> uh, family get togethers. Cause you know, I come from a big Polish family. So he'd, uh-huh. he'd be, be playing polka music on the accordion. And um, a lot of times in those family get togethers, he would ask for me to play the organ and, um, sometimes we would even play together. I definitely came from a musical family. Mm-hmm. However, I don't share all the likes that my <laughs> my parents right. would listen to. So there's plenty of music they listen to that I would not be listening to these days. But they, they had a love for country music as well, which I actually, I like some of that stuff. So um, mm-hmm. back when we were growing up, we would go on vacations to like Opryland and um, the Grand Ole Opry and, and such like that. So we would see some of these bands that they would like. And I, actually, um, I grew to love some of that country music. They, they would love the Oak Ridge Boys, you know, and mm-hmm. Alabama was a band that they liked. And, you know, of course, Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash and all them. Right. So um, we had a, a wide variety of music around the house. It wasn't far-fetched for me to become a musician because it was always kind of around. So looking back at the entirety of your life, who would you say has had the biggest impact on you? I would venture to say my parents. We were a pretty close family growing up. Now, these days, my sister lives in Seattle. You know, I live here in Atlanta. My, my parents live about 45 minutes away from me. My brother lives about two hours away from me here. So we're kind of close, except for my sister, <laughs> close, close by. <laughs> but we get together through Zoom and such. But... 
Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I would say I would say that my parents, I guess, are the biggest influence of how my life turned out. Right. These days. Definitely sounds that way. Yeah. So uh, something that people don't know about you. Any fun facts about Matthew Kaminsky that you would like to share with your fans? I actually was an extra in the movie Home Alone 2. <laughs> oh, wow. Tell us so more. If you're watching uh, Home Alone 2 on Disney+, Plus, you could actually pause it. There's a scene towards the beginning of the movie where they were in an auditorium for a Christmas play. Buzz and uh, Kevin, you know, Macaulay Culkin's character, they were singing the choir, and I was actually in the crowd for that scene. Huh. So on, uh, on Disney+, Plus, you could actually pause at one moment <laughs> do you, do you have the time stamp for us i, I don't right now but oh. <laughs> towards the top of the screen you could see me behind the guy with the white shirt and the suspenders i'm right behind that guy <laughs> <laughs> i'm writing that down right now behind suspenders guy white shirt i'm totally looking for that that is awesome so on the vhs edition you could actually see me a lot more but the oh, um wow. the disney plus or the dvd um, version of the movies uh, kind of cut me out a little bit on the top. Well, then. So that's the movie <laughs> magic, I guess. <laughs> uh-huh. Right, right. So you spend a lot of time at the ballpark. Do you find yourself constantly having to eat ballpark food, or does that get old? What What is your diet like as far as uh, – uh, what's so readily available right there at your place of work? There is a cafeteria for employees, but I do get tired of that food. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you know, th- there are hot dogs and, and pizza, like pizza and stuff like that. But a lot of times I would go eat. There's um, around Tourist Park is an area called the Battery. Uh-huh. And there are a lot of restaurants um, I would go to right before going into work or going into the okay. game. So on a, on a usual game day, um, the Braves start about 7.20. And I would get to the ballpark about 4 o'clock. You know, sometimes I would just eat right before I walk in because I get tired of the cafeteria food. Or I would, um, you know, around the whole um, Truist Park area, there's a lot of um, different places to eat, too. So I could stop by a Chick-fil-A or, or whatever before I go in. So, um, so there's a lot of... Uh, choices besides just hot dogs <laughs> is there anything that you want to accomplish in your lifetime that you always have in the back of your mind it's like one day i'm going to go here or i'm going to do this you know write the great american novel anything that, that you're hoping <laughs> to do someday you know what um a couple of years ago i was flown out to los gatos california and los gatos is right outside of san jose and every year they do a jazz festival where each weekend, there's a different jazz artist playing in that festival. Ah. So I got to, um, I got asked a couple of years ago, and they flew me out there and um, gave me room and board and um, really treated me like a king. It was great. And I oh, got to cool. play at that jazz festival. And that's something that um, I really aspire to do. I, I want to be able to play um, jazz on the organ with either my group or whatever group that I'm playing with and different festivals, maybe, you know, across the country or even in different parts of the world. So a lot of my um, kind of mentors or a lot of my idols um, in jazz get to play these festivals. And it's something that I've always kind of aspired to do. And and actually that festival I was telling about in Los Gatos, the week before me was Herb Albert. And if you know who Herb oh, wow. Albert is, Absolutely. he's the one who did uh, Tijuana Taxi. Yeah. Uh, and he started um, A&M Records to be considered to grace the same stage after, you know, the weekend after Herb Albert. It was quite an honor. Absolutely. Um, in January, I got to go to Los Angeles to, um, uh, I went to the, what's called the NAM show, which is a, a music merchant's show over there. And while I was in Los Angeles, I decided to record a CD over there. Actually, instead of a CD, I'm going to actually make it a, a vinyl record. Oh, so hopefully nice. um, hopefully by the start of the Braves season, I could get that vinyl record out and um, have ready for the Braves fans. Oh, make sure I know about that. I, I yeah. would love a copy. I'm going to look for that. Uh, and that will be available at MatthewKaminsky.com? Yep. It'll be on cool. MatthewKaminsky.com as well as um, there's a wonderful record store in the Battery um, called Waterloo Sunset, and um, in years past, I've I've sold my uh, 
I do have a CD of me playing baseball organ. At that record store, if you're ever by the stadium, um, you could actually purchase my CD over there if they have copies left. Hopefully they're sold out. Hopefully they they need copies. (laughs) uh, Yeah, well... And that's my I'll make problem. sure they I'm, stock up. I, I always get to the game so close to the first pitch that I haven't had a chance to really check out any of the shops around there. Uh, my kids and I ate at the restaurant, like, I don't know, it's like a brewery, I think, right across the entrance there. Other than that, we haven't had a chance to really experience that area and all the shops. So we'll try to get there uh, when we have some time because it's beautifully laid out uh, where basically commerce and the ballpark meet and uh right. it's, it's a beautiful yeah. setup right there it's almost like their own little uh you know city that they've created it really there. is because there's apartments right there too like, yeah seriously if if i had the means if i had unlimited income let's say i would totally have just some vacant apartment there for whenever i came back to atlanta which is several times a year Right there at the ballpark, it's really a unique setup. Or I think it's unique. I don't know. i got to yeah. be honest. I don't get to a lot of Major League Baseball stadiums. But the 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 ambience and the surroundings there just outside, I mean, just outside the gates of that ballpark are really, really special. Yeah. So uh, you're on Twitter, I know, at Braves Organist. You're on Facebook as well. What, what's your uh, handle over there? How can people find it's also, you on Facebook? It's also Braves Organist on Facebook. Oh, okay. Simple enough. Uh, and I also, also have um, a Braves Organist Instagram page. So so you've got Braves Organist on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You've got MatthewKaminsky.com. Any mm-hmm. other places people should be looking for you? Um, no, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm on YouTube <laughs> as well, but I, I usually post... Um, what I'm working on, on, on the social media and then either forwarded to the YouTube page. So, oh, yeah, so YouTube one of those yes. should get you going, uh, uh, to my stuff. <laughs> okay. Very cool. Anything that we haven't covered, uh, in this conversation that, that you want to make sure that we know about? I'm, I'm always accepting students. So, uh, no matter where you are in the world, uh, you could always, <laughs> uh, go on my website and, you know, my emails on there and, and contact me for lessons. Were you doing long distance lessons? Had you even thought about that before the world of Zoom opened up a year ago? Actually, I, I had been. I, I I wouldn't say that it was my primary thing, but I usually had one or two students who were taking online, you know, at any given moment. So it wasn't totally foreign to me, but I just had to learn how to really make it work for everyone because not every not all my students were that open to it at first. Mm-hmm. So I had to kind of convince them that it was something that was going to work. And I would say that a lot of my adult students actually enjoy online lessons, I think, more than in person. You know, the adult students, they don't want to either drive to the location. <laughs> you know, that takes another <laughs> chunk out of your day. Or they they might be a little bit more nervous having someone watch them right behind, like right next to them. You know, being at home and playing on your own instrument seems to be an added bonus for a lot of my students. So when I do go back to the schools that I teach at, I think that a lot of my students will actually choose to stay, um, stay online for the moment. You know what? The thought occurs to me, Matthew. In July, the Braves host the All-Star Game for Major League Baseball. Is there anything special that you're planning or thinking about? Have you even started thinking about it, about uh, what you might do for the fans? Not really, because um, <laughs> cause each year the Braves, they ask me to do things slightly differently each year. The same basic principles happen. So I play walk-ups and mm-hmm. you know I'll play charges and and different hand clapping songs, but sometimes I might play for batting practice. And then sometimes I might play a game or something in between an inning. Like a couple of years ago, I played Name That Tune. And then sometimes they, they might have me playing this, a thing called Oblivious Cam. So there's a little, <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you've ever been to Braves game, like uh-huh. if you're not paying attention, you might actually be on the screen while I play a song for you. Yep. <laughs> um, I actually think that's pretty cool that I don't have to like, that it's not a routine all the time. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Matthew Kaminsky, the Atlanta Braves organist at Truist Park. 
uh, for making time here on At The Mic. This has been a sincere pleasure for me. I wish you much success in the future. Thank you for keeping us entertained and always thinking uh, about the game within the game uh, when the Atlanta Braves play. Well, it's my pleasure, and thank you for having me on the podcast. Well, I, for one, am ready for this baseball season and hearing all the creative ways that Matthew will bring us that game within the game that he talked about. And that's going to do it for this edition of At The Mic. And as always, I'm so grateful that you made time for us. Please head over to atthemikeshow.com. If you missed any of the previous episodes, there are 40 others that preceded this one in the show archives over there, at themikeshow.com. Please rate and review wherever possible. And send me a note or leave a voicemail if you like. Would love to see you at themikeshow.com. I'm looking forward to our next time together when my very fun buddy Tank Spencer joins us. And that's going to be our next episode of At The Mic. This has been At The Mic with Keith, an independent podcast production. Look for At The Mic Show on Twitter to connect. 